Hello, this is The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Chapter 2. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke and finally, with a transcendent effort, of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest. And immediately, the ash-gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud, which screens their obscure operations from your sight. This is the answer to number one. Um, where is the Valley of Ashes? It is between West Egg and New York City. Um, it just says New York in the book because that's how people from New York say it. They say, oh, New York. The whole state is New York. Like, where Gatsby, West Egg and East Egg are also in New York. New York City is Manhattan, like downtown, where all that stuff is. So it's between West Egg and New York City. You can put NYC for short. Um, what does it represent? It is the effects of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, all this ash and factories and smoke and stuff like that. In between Huck Finn and now, the Industrial Revolution happened. Factories, cars, railroads, stuff like that. So the Valley of Ashes is the byproduct or the effects of the Industrial Revolution on America. But above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over it, you perceive, after a moment, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose. Evidently, some wild wag of an oculist set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens and then sank down himself into eternal blindness or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless days under sun and rain, brood on over the solemn dumping ground. So here's one of the big symbols of the novel, um, this billboard. Describe the billboard number two. It is the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. E-C-K-L-E-B-U-R-G. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. Um, they are large blue eyes with yellow glasses. It's basically just these eyes staring out from the billboard for this guy who owns, um, who makes, who sells glasses, an oculist, someone who sells glasses. So large blue eyes with yellow glasses, this advertisement looming over the Valley of Ashes, just looking, watching out over everything. The Valley of Ashes is bounded on one side by a small, foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as half an hour. There is always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. The fact that he had one was insisted upon wherever he was known. His acquaintances resented the fact that he turned up in popular restaurants with her and, leaving her at a table, sauntered about chatting with whomsoever he knew. Though I was curious to see her, I had no desire to meet her, but I did. I went up to New York with Tom on the train one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ash heaps, he jumped to his feet and, taking hold of my elbow, literally forced me from the car. We're getting off, he insisted. I want you to meet my girl. I think he'd tanked up a good deal at luncheon, and his determination to have my company bordered on violence. The supercilious assumption was that on Sunday afternoon, I had nothing better to do. I followed him over a low whitewash railroad fence, and we walked back 100 yards along the road under Dr. Eckelberg's persistent stare. The only building in sight was a small block of yellow brick sitting on the edge of the wasteland, a sort of compact main street ministering to it, and contiguous to, mean next to, absolutely nothing. One of the three shops it contained was for rent, and another was an all-night restaurant approached by a trail of ashes. The third was a garage, repairs, George B. Wilson, cars bought and sold, and I followed Tom inside. The interior was unprosperous and bare. The only car visible was the dust-covered wreck of a Ford which crouched in a dim corner. It had occurred to me that this shadow of a garage must be a blind and that sumptuous and romantic apartments were concealed overhead. A blind, like a fake front, so that it really is these nice things um, that are actually there. When the proprietor himself, the owner, that's George Wilson, 
appeared in the door of an office, wiping his hands on a piece of waste. He was a blonde, spiritless man, anemic and faintly handsome. When he saw us, a damp gleam of hope sprang into his light blue eyes. Notice the colors there. Blonde is yellow, uh, associated with decay or death. Uh, blue eyes is, uh, blue is a color of sadness a lot of times in this book. So this is kind of a sad man, but he's hopeful right now. Hello, Wilson, old man, said Tom, slapping him jovial, jovially on the shoulder. How's business? Uh, I can't complain, answered Wilson unconvincingly. When are you going to sell me that car? Next week. I've got my man working on it now. Works pretty, pretty slow, don't he? No, he doesn't, said Tom coldly. And if you feel that way about it, maybe I better sell it somewhere else after all. I don't mean that, explained Wilson quickly. I just meant... There's the first part of number three, why George thinks that Tom has come to the garage. And it's um, that he wants Tom to sell him a car. There's some fancy car of Tom's that he'd like to buy and fix up and resell. So first part of number three is to sell him. He thinks he's Tom's there to sell him a car. His voice faded off and Tom glanced impatiently around the garage. Then I heard footsteps on a stairs. And in a moment, the thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the office door. She was in the middle 30s and faintly stout, but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously, as some women can. Her face, above the spotted dress of dark blue crepe de chine, contained no facet or gleam of beauty, but there was an immediately perceptible vitality about her, as if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. She smiled slowly and, walking through her husband as if he were a ghost, shook hands with Tom, looking him flush in the eye. Then she wet her lips and, without turning around, spoke to her husband in a soft, coarse voice. Get some chairs, why don't you, so somebody can sit down. Oh, sure, agreed Wilson hurriedly, and went toward the little office, mingling immediately with the cement color of the walls. A white ashen dust veiled his dark suit and his pale hair as it veiled everything in the vicinity, except his wife, who moved close to Tom. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him, just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. So there's a second part of number three about why Tom is really there. He wants to meet up with his mistress. Her name is Myrtle, M-Y-R-T-L-E. So he's there. He wants to meet up with his mistress. He wants to tell her to get on the train so they can meet up um, in New York City. And uh, this is called getting cut. Tom, uh, George leaves the, the room and on Myrtle's request to hey, go get a chair for us so he could sit down. As soon as he leaves, Tom goes up to her and says, I want to see you. Let's go. And she's like, all right, I'll meet you. And poor George has no idea. He comes back with a chair and they go on their merry way. So he has no idea he's, he's getting cheated on. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes, those are fireworks, in a row along the railroad track. Terrible place, isn't it? said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg with a billboard. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson? <laughs> he thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb, he doesn't know he's alive. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York, or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car, on the train sitting in different cars. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. So he, other people, everyone knows he's having an affair, but he doesn't sit in the, in the same car with her, but that would be a little too gauche. So he makes her sit in another part of the train. She had changed her dress to a brown-figured muslin which stretched right over her, tight, sorry, which stretched tight over her rather wide hips as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand, she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine and, in the station drugstore, some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs in the solemn echoing drive, she let four taxi cabs drive away before she selected a new one, lavender colored with gray upholstery, and in this, we slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. But immediately, she turned sharply from the window and leaned forward, and leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're nice to have. A dog. We backed up to a gray old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. They were mutts, in other words. What kind are they? asked Miss Wilson eagerly as he came to the taxi window. 
All kinds. What kind do you want, lady? I'd like to get one of those police dogs. I don't suppose you got that kind? The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged in his hand, and drew one up, wriggling by the, neck, by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man, when, with disappointment in his voice. It's more of a, an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rag of a back. Look at that coat. Some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching cold. I think it's cute, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog? He looked at it admiringly. Uh, that dog will cost you ten dollars. The Airedale. Undoubtedly there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startlingly white. Changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with rapture. Is it a boy or a girl? She asked delicately. That dog, uh, that dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go and buy ten more dogs with it. We drove over, so he doesn't think the dogs were ten dollars. We drove over to Fifth Avenue, so warm and soft, almost pastoral on the summer Sunday afternoon, that I wouldn't have been surprised to see a great flock of white sheep turn the quarter. Hold on, I said. I have to leave you here. No, you don't, interposed Tom quickly. Myrtle will be hurt if you don't come up to the apartment, won't you, Myrtle? Come on, she urged. I'll telephone my sister Catherine. She's said to be very beautiful by people who ought to know. Well, I'd like to, but... We went on, cutting back again over the park toward the West Hundreds. At 158th Street, the cab stopped at one slice in a long white cake of apartment houses. That's another great Fitzgerald line. One slice in a long white cake of apartment houses. Throwing a regal homecoming glance about the neighborhood, like, oh, thank God I'm home. Mrs. Wilson gathered up her dog and her other purchases and went haughtily in. I'm going to have the McKees come up, she announced as we rose in the elevator. And of course I got to call up my sister too. So there is um, number four. Make no mistake, this is not her apartment. This is Tom's side piece apartment for <coughs> Sorry, I sneeze. Uh, for where he keeps his, I don't know, maybe mistresses plural. This is the one we know of. But Tom's rich, so he's got an apartment in the city. And this is where he brings Myrtle to have their fling, to keep her on the side. But she acts like it's her place. So number four, how does she behave on arriving at Tom's apartment? She acts like she owns the apartment and she calls friends to come over. She says, it says she threw a homecoming glance about the neighborhood. Like, thank God I'm finally home, okay? To be clear, she lives above the garage with George, okay? The, the guy who pumps gas for a living and fixes up cars. She does not live here, but that's how she acts, number four. She acts like she owns the apartment and she calls some friends to come over because she's finally home. So this is kind of what she gets out of the deal. Tom gets what a lot of men want out of the deal, someone who's not his wife. She gets to feel like she's special and she lives in New York City in like a penthouse apartment in this fancy neighborhood. Okay, so that's that's her, that's the trade-off. Oh, sneezy. Um, the apartment was on the top floor, penthouse. A small living room, a small dining room, a small bedroom, and a bath. The living room was crowded to the doors with a set of tapestry furniture entirely too large for it, so that to move about was to stumble continually over scenes of ladies swinging in the gardens of Versailles. The only picture was an over-enlarged photograph, apparently a hen sitting on a blurred rock. Looked at from a distance, however, the hen resolved itself into a bonnet, and the countenance, the face, of a stout old lady beamed down into the room. So it's a really blurry photograph. It looks like a hen on a rock, but it's actually an old lady. Several old copies of Town Tattle lay on the table together with a copy of Simon Called Peter and some of the small scandal magazines of Broadway. So these are the tabloid magazines, equivalent of the National Enquirer or Star. Mrs. Wilson was first concerned with the dog. A reluctant elevator boy went for a box full of straw and some milk, to which he added on his own initiative a tin of large hard dog biscuits, one of which decomposed apathetically in the saucer of milk all afternoon. Meanwhile, Tom brought out a bottle of whiskey from a locked bureau drawer. I have been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon. So everything that happened has a dim, hazy cast over it, although until after 8 o'clock, the apartment was full of cheerful sun. Sitting on Tom's lap, Mrs. Wilson called up several people on the telephone. Then there were no cigarettes, so I went out to buy some at the drugstore on the corner. When I came back, they had disappeared. So I sat down discreetly in the living room and read a chapter of Simon Called Peter. Either it was terrible stuff or the whiskey distorted things because it didn't make any sense to me. So Tom and Myrtle went off to 
do the deed. They don't have to shag. And so he's just sitting alone in the in the living room, reading tabloids and drinking. Just as Tom and Myrtle, after the first drink, Mrs. Wilson and I called each other by our first names, reappeared, company commenced to arrive at the apartment door. The sister, Catherine, so Myrtle's sister, was a slender, worldly girl of about 30 with a solid, sticky bob of red hair and a complexion powdered milky white. Her eyebrows had been plucked and then drawn on again at a more rakish angle, but the efforts of nature toward the restoration of the old alignment gave a blurred air to her face. I love that line. She's plucked off her eyebrows and drawn them back on, but since they're kind of uneven, it looks like her. she's always moving her face up and down like this because her eyebrows seem blurry. Because as, as nature is starting to grow the eyebrows back in, it looks like she has two sets of eyebrows. When she moved about, there was an incessant clicking as innumerable pottery bracelets jingled up and down upon her arms. She came in with such a proprietary haste, meaning like she owns the place, and looked around so possessively at the furniture, I wondered if she lived there. But when I asked her, she laughed immoderately, repeated my question aloud, and told me she lived with a girlfriend at a hotel. Mr. McKee was a pale, feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of lather on his cheekbone, and he was most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game, and I gathered later that he was a photographer and had made the dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. So he's a photographer. He did the awful photograph that's hanging on the wall. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had photographed her 127 times since they had been married. Mrs. Wilson had changed her costume. This is three different outfits now, if you're keeping score. Sometime before, and was now attired in an elaborate afternoon dress of cream-colored chiffon, which gave out a continual rustle as she swept about the room. With the influence of the dress, her personality had also undergone a change. The intense vitality that had been so remarkable in the garage was converted into impressive hauteur. Hauteur is thinking a lot of yourself, a snobbery. Her laughter, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected moment by moment. And as she expanded, like as her personality got bigger and she got louder, the room grew smaller around her until she seemed to be revolving on a noisy, creaking pivot through the smoky air. My dear, she told her sister in a high mincing shout, most of these fellas will cheat you every time. All they think of is money. I had a woman up here last week to look at my feet, and when she gave me the bill, you'd have thought she had my appendicitis out. Clever thing by, by Fitzgerald right there. Had my appendicitis out, okay? She, she says the word wrong. You don't have your appendicitis out. If you suffer from appendicitis, which means your appendix has burst, then you, then you get your appendix out. You don't have your appendicitis out. So she's trying to sound classy and cultured, talking about a girl that they came to look at her feet, do a pedicure or something like that, like how rich this lifestyle she lives when she's with Tom in New York City is. But she gives away right there her lack of education and her lack of sort of high class by using the word wrong. So Fitzgerald does that intentionally. What was the name of the woman? Asked Mrs. McKee. Mrs. Eberhardt. She goes around looking at people's feet in their own homes. I like your dress, remarked Mrs. McKee. I think it's adorable. Mrs. Wilson rejected the compliment by raising her eyebrow in disdain. It's just a crazy old thing, she said. I just slip it on sometimes when I don't care what I look like. She's lying. This is the third different outfit she's put on this chapter. But it looks wonderful on you, if you know what I mean, pursued Mrs. McKee. If Chester could only get you in that pose, I think he could make something of it, says her photographer husband. We all looked in silence at Mrs. Wilson, who removed a strand of hair from over her eyes, and looked back at us with a brilliant smile. Uh -huh. Mr. McKee regarded her intently with his head on one side, and then moved his hand back and forth slowly in front of his face. He's doing that thing directors do like this, where he's lining up the shot. I should change the light, he said after a moment. I'd like to bring out the modeling of the features, and I'd try to get hold of all the back hair. I wouldn't think of changing the light, cried Mrs. McKee. I think it's... Her husband said, shh, and we all looked at the subject again, being Myrtle, whereupon Tom Buchanan is bored of this. He yawned audibly and got to his feet. Ah, oh, you McKees have something to drink, he said. Get some more ice and mineral water, Myrtle, before everybody goes to sleep. I told that boy about the ice, Myrtle raised her eyebrows in despair at the shiftlessness of the lower orders. Shiftlessness means the laziness of the lower class people, the workers and stuff. 
these people. You have to keep after them all the time. There is your answer to number five. Okay, Myrtle is just, oh, I can't believe these people, these working class people who didn't bring us the ice. You have to just keep on them all the time, these people. The irony, number five, what is the irony? She's one of these people. Okay, she's married to a guy who owns a garage. She pumps gas uh, for a living. So she is one of these people. But when she's in New York playing house with Tom, she gets to pretend like she's upper crust like the rest of these people. And you can, and you can talk about the laziness of the lower class. So number five, she's one of, quote, these people. She looked at me and laughed pointlessly. Then she flounced over to the dog, kissed it with ecstasy, and swept into the kitchen, implying that a dozen chefs awaited her orders there. I've done some nice things out on Long Island, asserted Mr. McKee. Tom looked at him blankly. Two of them we have framed downstairs. To what? demanded Tom. Two studies. One of them I call Montauk Point, the gulls, and the other I call Montauk Point, the sea. So he thinks he's really fancy with his photographs. He calls them studies instead of photographs, like they're really impressive. The sister Catherine sat down beside me on the couch. Do you live down on Long Island too? She inquired. I live at West Egg. Really? I was down there at a party about a month ago at a man named Gatsby's. Do you know him? Well, I live next door to him. Well, they say he's a nephew or a cousin of Kaiser Wilhelm's. That's where all his money comes from. Really? She nodded. I'm scared of him. I'd hate to have him get anything on me. This absorbing information about my neighbor was interrupted by Mrs. McKee's pointing suddenly at Catherine. Chester, I think you could do something with her, she broke out. But Mr. McKee only nodded in a bored way and turned his attention to Tom. I'd like to do more work on Long Island if I could get the entry. All I ask is that they should give me a start. Ask Myrtle, said Tom, breaking into a short shout of laughter as Mrs. Wilson entered with the tray. <laughs> She'll give you a letter of introduction, won't you, Myrtle? Do what? She asked, startled. You'll give McKee a letter of introduction to your husband so he can do some studies of him. His lips moved past silently for a moment as he invented George B. Wilson at the gasoline pump or something like that. <laughs> so Tom is being a major uh, D right here. He's insulting both Myrtle and George and Mr. McKee all in one take. Mr. McKee says, hey, if you could introduce me some some of your fancy rich friends on Long Island, I could do some studies. I could make some money and do some photo photographs of them. And Tom, instead of introducing his friend, says, oh, Myrtle could hook you up. You could take pictures of her husband. It's George Wilson at the gas pump. So you could take pictures of her husband pumping gas because, ha, 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 her husband pumps gas for a living. What a loser. Like, he's just being a total jerk to basically everyone in the room at this point. That's Tom's specialty. Catherine leaned close to me and whispered in my ear, neither of them can stand the person they're married to. Can't they? Can't stand them. She looked at Myrtle and then at Tom. What I say is, why go on living with them if they can't stand them? If I was them, I'd get a divorce and get married to each other right away. She doesn't like Wilson either? The answer to this was unexpected. It came from Myrtle, who had overheard the question, and it was violent and obscene. Like, I think she probably said, F him, from the other room. You see, cried Catherine triumphantly. She lowered her voice again. It's really his wife that's keeping them apart. She's a Catholic and they don't believe in divorce. Daisy was not a Catholic, and I was a little shocked at the elaborateness of the lie. So there is number six. Tom has told his side piece, Myrtle, oh, I'd love to marry you. I'd love to marry you, baby, but uh, you see, uh, my wife's a Catholic, and they don't believe in divorce. She can't get divorced. So there's the answer number six, is why hasn't Tom left Daisy? Because Daisy's a Catholic, and Catholics don't believe in divorce. But as Nick says, that is not true. So it's just Tom making up a lie to keep Myrtle kind of off of him. Like, look, I want to have a relationship, a sexual relationship with you in the city, but I don't want to actually commit to you. You're just some, your, your husband owns a garage. Like, no way. So I'll use you, but we're not getting married. But he doesn't tell her that. He leads her on. Uh, when they do get married, continued Catherine, they're going west to live for a while until it blows over. It'd be more discreet to go to Europe. <gasps> oh, do you like Europe? She exclaimed surprisingly. I just got back from Monte Carlo. Really? Just last year. I went over there with another girl. Stay long? No, we just went to Monte Carlo and back. We went by way of Marseille. We had over $1,200 when we started, but we got gypped out of it all in two days in the private rooms. 
We had an awful time getting back, I can tell you. God, how I hated that town. The late afternoon sky bloomed in the window for a moment like the blue honey of the Mediterranean, and then the shrill voice of Mrs. McKee called me back into the room. I almost made a mistake, too, she declared vigorously. I almost married a little kike who'd been after me for years. I knew he was below me. Everybody kept saying to me, Lucille, that man's way below you. But if I had met Chester, he'd have got me for sure. One note about that word in there, I almost married a little kike. Kike is an ethnic slur for Jewish people. It's basically the N-word of words that people call Jewish people, so it's very not cool. Um, this is the 1920s. It would have been way more acceptable then, but that's what it means. She, she almost married a, a Jewish guy. And she eventually married Mr. McKee, Chester, the guy who takes the bad photographs. Yes, but listen, said Myrtle Wilson, nodding her head up and down. At least you didn't marry him. I know I didn't. Well, I married him, said Myrtle ambiguously, and that's the difference between your case and mine. Why did you, Myrtle? demanded Catherine. Nobody forced you to, Myrtle considered. I married him because I thought he was a gentleman, she said finally. I thought he knew something about breeding, but he wasn't fit to lick my shoe. You were crazy about him for a while, said Catherine. Crazy about him, cried Myrtle incredibly. Who said I was crazy about him? I never was any more crazy about him than I was about that man there. She pointed suddenly at me, at Nick, and everyone looked at me accusingly. I tried to show by my expression that I had played no part in her past. The only crazy I was was when I married him. I knew right away I made a mistake. He borrowed somebody's best suit to get married in and never even told me about it. And the man came after it one day when he was out. She looked around to see who was listening. Oh, is that your suit? I said. This is the first I ever heard about it. But I gave it to him. And then I lay down and cried to beat the band all afternoon. There is number seven. When Myrtle realized her husband actually was poor, I guess he misrepresented himself to her. When he had to borrow a suit to get married in, the guy whose suit it was came back and, and claimed it. So there's number seven. He had to borrow a suit to get married in, and the guy came back to, to reclaim it. She really ought to get away from him, resumed Catherine to me. They've been living over that garage for 11 years, and Tom's the first sweetie she ever had. That's so nice, only one... one uh, man in uh, 11 years that she cheated on the bottle of whiskey a second one was now in constant demand by all present excepting Catherine who felt just as good on nothing at all Tom rang for the janitor to send and sent him for some celebrated sandwiches which were a complete supper in themselves I wanted to get out and walk eastward toward the park through the soft twilight but each time I tried to go I became entangled in some wild strident argument which pulled me back as if with ropes into my chair. Yet high over the city our line of yellow windows must have, must have contributed their share of human secrecy to the casual watcher in the darkening streets. And I was him too, looking up and wondering. I was within and without, simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. That's a great line from Nick that he's within and without. That's the way he is through much of the story. He's in the story, but he mostly just observes these other people doing these crazy things. He doesn't really actually do a whole lot. He just tells us about it. Myrtle pulled her chair close to mine, and suddenly her warm breath poured over me the story of her first meeting with Tom. It was on the little two seats facing each other that are always the last ones left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister and spend the night. He had on a dress suit and patent leather shoes, and I couldn't keep my eyes off him. But every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement over his head. When we come into the station, he was next to me, and his white shirt front pressed against my arm. And so I told him I'd have to call a policeman, but he knew I lied. I was so excited that when I got into the taxi with him, I didn't hardly know what I wasn't getting onto a subway train. All I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever. You can't live forever. She turned to Mrs. McKee, and the room rang full of her artificial laughter. My dear, <laughs> she cried, I'm going to give you this dress as soon as I'm through with it. I've got to get another one tomorrow. I'm going to make a list of all the things I've got to get. A massage, and a wave, and a collar for the dog, and one of those cute little ashtrays where you touch a spring, and a wreath with a black silk bow for Mother's grave that'll last all summer. I've got to write down a list so I won't forget all the things i got to do. It was nine o'clock. Almost immediately afterwards, I looked at my watch and found it was 10. So this is Nick being drunk, and Fitzgerald, the well-known drunk, he knows what, what it feels like when you're drunk. Oh, it's 9 o'clock, and then like a second later, wow, it's 10 o'clock, you lose time. 
Mr. McKee was asleep on a chair with his fists clenched in his lap like a photograph of a man in act of action. Taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek the remains of the spot of dried lather that had worried me all the afternoon. The little dog was sitting on the table looking with blind eyes through the smoke and from time to time groaning faintly. People disappeared, reappeared, made plans to go somewhere and then lost each other, searched for each other, found each other a few feet away. Again, this is Fitzgerald chronicling what it's like when a party disintegrates and everyone's drunk. It's like everyone's making plans, trying to find each other. Oh, no, where'd, where'd so-and-so go? We were supposed to leave. Who's my ride? Blah, blah, blah. Fitzgerald is well experienced at the party atmosphere. Sometime before midnight, now the argument starts. Sometime toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. So Myrtle's getting drunk and kind of up in Tom's face about the fact that he's married and she keeps telling her he wants to be with her. So she says, Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want. Daisy, Daisy. Making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. So there's your answer to number eight. What did Myrtle refuse to keep saying? She kept saying Daisy, Tom's wife's name. And what does Tom do in response? He breaks her nose. A little domestic violence to, to end near the end of the chapter. Then there were bloody towels upon the bathroom floor and women's voices scolding and high over the confusion, a long broken wail of pain. Mr. McKee awoke from his doze and started in a daze toward the door. I love that. Awoke from his doze and started in a daze toward the door. When he had gone halfway, he turned around and stared at the scene. His wife and Catherine scolding and consoling as they stumbled here and there among the crowded furniture with articles of aid and the despairing figure on the couch bleeding flu bleeding fluently and trying to spread a copy of town tattle over the tapestry scenes of versailles and so trying to get the get the blood stop the blood from getting on the couch then mr mckee turned and continued on out the door taking my hat from the chandelier i followed come to lunch someday he suggested as we groaned down in the elevator where anywhere keep your hands off the lever snapped the elevator boy i beg your pardon said mr mckee with dignity i didn't know i was touching it all right, I agree. I'll be glad to. I was standing beside his bed, and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear, with a great portfolio in his hands. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery Horse, Brooklyn Bridge. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of Pennsylvania Station, staring at the morning Tribune and waiting for the four o'clock train. Very strange ending to that um, chapter. A lot of, uh, a lot of critics have said this is Fitzgerald intimating that Nick perhaps is gay or bi and had an experience that you couldn't write such things in the 1920s. But the lines, keep your hands off the lever, Mr. McKee saying, I didn't know I was touching it. Um, Nick then says, I'll be glad to, like I'll be glad to touch the lever, maybe a little phallic thing there. And then the dot, 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 he's standing next to the bed and Mr. McKee is in his underwear showing him pictures. And then dot, 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 Nick wakes up um, in Penn Station waiting for a train like he lost time or he didn't want to tell us what happened there so there's number nine about what some critics have said about the purpose of the end of that chapter or what Fitzgerald is trying to hint at but he's not allowed to write in the 1920s it wouldn't no mainstream book publisher would, would include that so thank you that was Great Gatsby chapter two